All right, so we're going to pick up where we left off last time. We we're talking about Metasploit. I didn't get all the way through because I talked about the midterm. So we're going to pick up with set, um, the social generic toolkit, and do a little demo with it. Uh, so uh, we're going to do basically an example of uh, a malicious uh, attachment that you would use in a spear phishing email. Um, so obviously the goal of the spear phishing email is to uh, entice or uh, trick the victim to download and perhaps open the attachment. So uh, set uh, supports a number of vectors to actually deliver the spear phishing email and it depends on basically the target uh, email network and what you would like to use. So basically a real world example would be say for bad guys the, the attack, attacker wants to target basically example.com um, depending on perhaps the font of the target system they may register example.com with the L being a one and may render the same or perhaps uh, manipulate a different number of different ways perhaps repeat characters perhaps replace them with a numerical equivalent or perhaps uh, replace them with perhaps an extended Unicode equivalent that looks the same, but perhaps has a uh, asterisk or accent or sub accent on the character set that may not actually uh, be detected by the user. So they may actually trust the, the email and click it, um, especially if, if they're looking through the headers, this could be useful to perhaps trick them if they're not careful enough. So then basically what the attackers would do after registering this new domain and perhaps whatever subdomain they want. Um, they then send a mass email to the target company from their domain. And given a large enough company, it's likely you're going to trick at least one person. And so if you attach the malicious PDF and they click open attachment instead of save as to desktop or something, it will open it with whatever the default application is to open that uh, attachment, namely the PDF. And if that, if that, uh, PDF viewer or application has a vulnerability that can be exploited by the malicious attachment. Um, however, that requires either getting lucky for the attacker or for the attacker having done some reconnaissance, perhaps uh, use some social engineering in a phone call to determine what their standard setup is. Um, perhaps figure out what version of Adobe Reader they're using or if they're using Boxer Reader or whatnot. Um, and so at doesn't always require actually an application exploit. Perhaps there could be a malicious JavaScript that downloads and then executes uh, basically the actual payload. Um, so that would be a stager, the JavaScript. Um, and then it would download and then execute a stage, which would perhaps be an interpreter reverse shell, causing a connection to be made back to the, uh, the attacker's listener. And then he has then shell access to the system. So set can automate all of this, even the reverse listener. Um, although it can't automate the domain registration, if you want to involve that in an attack. So the domain registration, uh, there's, you can go GoDaddy or whatever. And, and there's no authenticating who you are or tracing, I can use an anonymous name. I mean, so, because um, if I do a who is, uh, to that domain, man. Isn't there a way for me to track back and figure out who did that? If they did, if they did a who is, and you have, you know, fakeexample.com, or however you made it to look similar, it from their records, unless you tricked the the registration, or there's a malicious register out there, which I don't believe there really are, um, they would deter, they would detect that something's wrong just from the who is request, who is look up. So that's one way they could start discover the attack. However, they have to basically look at the email headers to see where this came from. Um, so the, basically, the, the goal for this mass mail attack is to convince people that you're part of the company. Hey, you all need to look at this. This may be the new rules for time reporting for 2003 to comply with new tax laws. Something convincing naming. Obviously, you can <laughs> use your, your imagination to come up with a number of examples. Um, so 
if they look at the headers and they see that there's something wrong and they do a who is on the, the, the domain that's listed in the headers that you sent your email from, they would be able to basically detect who the attacker is, at least from the information given to the registrar, which could be in itself fraudulent. But they at least be able to determine from that lookup, that who is lookup, that hey, this does not, this is not someone who's belongs to our company, and this is not a, this is not our domain, this is not legit. So then they could send an email to the system administrator, and then the system administrator could send out a company-wide broadcast, hey, this is a phishing attack, a spear phishing attack that's extremely targeted against us. Make sure to check this stuff out. So um, on that note, uh, many of the vectors that social, the social engineering toolkit uh, provides are easily discovered by uh, the victims in such a similar manner. The entire reason they're so successful is that Basically, it plays off statistics. If you give, if you're targeting a big enough company, because of human stupidity, habits, and all the flaws that we talked about in the social engineering lecture, there's a sufficiently acceptable chance that your exploit, your attack, will work. So, um, so I'm going to show basically a demo of uh, sets uh, feature for crafting basically. Uh, malicious PDFs, um, and I have a, 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 a victim virtual machine set up that's running a specific version of uh, uh, Foxit Reader, PDF uh, Reader, and uh, it's going to exploit a uh, vulnerability in that version. So, I'm going to, did everyone read that? I made it bold. I'm going to do social engineering attacks, I'm going to create uh, uh, infectious media, and I'm going to go with a file format exploit. <coughs> so specifically, this is usually the realm of PDFs and stuff like that. So I need to enter in my hey, my address. Yeah, although you have to set it twice. Whoops. What is separate? Uh, I think it's Ruby. It might be Python. I'm not sure. So 103. <laughs> yeah, so Metasploit has a lot of performance issues because of various factors. Some claim it's because Ruby is a piece of crap, but um, it's because I think more is, it's a large framework. And in general, when you're working with very large frameworks, this is it's only on version like 4.3. Surely later down the line, it'll become more optimized. But uh, it does use a lot of resources when it's being initialized, especially MSF console and stuff like that. And set itself is actually uh, kind of, it's more like a utility. It doesn't require the entire Metasploit framework to be initialized beforehand. Um, it just uses specific things like uh, through, uh, what is it? The, the, the command line version, the command line interface from that split. I can't remember it off the top of my head. I talked about it last time. It's in my slides. So I'm going to go with uh, uh, payload uh, 16 because it exploits Foxit PDF reader version 4.1.1. That's what I have set up. Um, and so this is basically a, a stack buffer overflow that allows for exploitation of uh, attackers' uh, instructions. So I'm going to give it, um, since it's 32 bit, a reverse interpreter TCP session for the payload, and I need to enter in my IP address again. And I'm going to tell it to connect back on the default port 443. And so it's going to take some time to actually generate the file format. Um, and when it does, here we go. It's going to output it in a, a, a default folder within the set directory. Um, so it has completed creating the file. It's output it to the directory. And now it basically prompts me whether or not I want to start the listener. Um, I'm going to say no, because I already have Metasploit run up, uh, running. And I have ability to do it in a more streamlined fashion. So by looking at the basically PDF 
Um, we're just looking at basically the hex dump of it. And we can see that as the PDF document headers, and there's a lot of 20s in there, which are actually spaces. Um, and then there's some content to it. Um, so this is should be all exploit code um, in one of these sections. I'm not going to go over the format of PDF files. So that's the output of that. Now, I've already, for the sake of this demo, transferred the, uh, <clears throat> the malware to the victim. Um, so I'm going to set, I have my listener set up. I'm going to run it. And now, here's my Windows XP victim, and I have it just named Accounts 2013. So when I open this, it's going to be run by Foxit Reader, and it's going to exploit the vulnerability. And so you can see there's activity in the bottom left here where my interpreter session is going. This actually uh, received the connection uh, from the victim and is sending back the stage um, to basically open a interpreter session. So after, after this demo, I'm going to actually go into the details of the interpreter in some detail. Um, so I'm just wrapping up to last time's lecture. So basically, it takes a little bit to get going, um, but after a few minutes, it gets pretty streamlined. So with this, uh, with this payload running, I'm going to actually jump back to the. I'm going to jump back to the lecture, and you can see that uh, this PDF is blank. And if the user tries to do anything, it just says not responding. But no window is popping up. Say this one, this has encountered an exception and needs to close because actually the interpreter, the payload has taken over. It's not just unique to interpret it, but whatever payload has been set up has taken over and is currently running without exceptions. What would happen if the it? Uh, it would kill my session. So I'll, I'll demonstrate that. Session died. And so... Uh, if I'm using an existing port, then... Uh, Perhaps not. So I'm yeah, going to reset. Wait and you know, like try to escalate the and then Yes, there's a lot of stuff that can be automated. Um, Armitage is the GUI interface for Metasploit, and there's a whole suite of uh, basically bots that are made to automate parts of. Uh, Metasploit, automate parts of interpreter, automate parts, anything you can think of. Um, it's actually growing quite advanced. That's interesting. So, I'm going to let that run for a little bit and get streamlined. So, the PDF remain the same or is it the same? I have not <coughs> done any testing to see if the PDF is the same thing each time. It may be. Um, however, it wouldn't be too difficult to modify set to have it encode the payload, the interpreter payload, randomly each time. Uh, so then it wouldn't be something that you could just build a signature and then defeat every instance of. If you use encoding in the actual uh, instructions for the payload, um, you could defeat that. So. Which brings us to today's lecture. Post-exploitation. Now that we've actually hacked a system, what do you do? What do attackers do? What do penetration testers do? Um, so uh, I forgot what news site I found this on. I think Y Combinator. But uh, this is unrelated, but some interesting news that uh, GCHQ, which is basically the British equivalent of the NSA, they've been tasked with securing the internet for basically the UK. Uh, if you go to apply for a job there and you submit, you know, username, password on your registration form, and you uh, forget your password at any time, if you enter basically your email in the "I forgot my password" form, it will email you a plain text version of your password. So. 
GCHQ. I, I hadn't heard of them before. Um, but, you know, they're like agencies like that, like to avoid press. Anyways, so even if they're encrypting their passwords on their back end, it's still being stored in a reversible format. An attacker may be able to get that key. Obviously, the web application has access to that key or some component in that uh, that process of getting the, uh, the, your original plain text password emailed to you has that key. So if an attacker has access to that system, um, they can get that key and re basically decrypt all the passwords in that database. Or they're just stored in plain text, both of which are obviously uh, poor choices for security implementations. Um, and even that uh, resetting, there's lots of critics out there uh, about resetting passwords over email because email's insecure. But anyways, um, be that as may, let's get to the talk. Um, so we're going to go over basically the, the basics of post-exploitation and a little bit of like the theory. Um, then we're going to basically have a little bit of a review for basically credentials and authorization because those are basically keys to the kingdom. Once you get one key, you basically want to get more. You want to, it's like Pokemon, you want to catch them all almost. Um, so we've gone over basically Linux and Dev and the permission systems and how things are worked, uh, like access control decisions are, are made in Linux. But we haven't touched Windows at all. So we're going to go in depth on that today. I didn't want to do it before because it's too complicated. Um, and then we're going to uh, talk about interpreter in depth. So there's a lot of resources I use for this lecture, the Windows internals books. Uh, this is internal suite. If, you, if any of you use Windows for your main operating system, um, the, the control shift escape or task manager, the control alt delete task manager uh, is pretty inferior to the ones provided by the system internal suite. It was started in 1996 by a guy named Mark Rosinovich. I forget his partner that joined him late shortly afterwards. It was bought up by Microsoft, but it's so good, but basically provides dozens of utilities for really getting into the internals of Windows. There's a application that will show you every single place uh, that an option, every single place that things can be set to auto run on startup. Um, and then the Proc Explorer is fantastic uh, uh, replacement for the task manager. It allows you to basically, I'll have a screenshot of it later, it allows you to basically dig in depth to the variable settings and the security identifiers and settings and the entire process tree and file descriptions that are open, ports that are open, and everything per process, per thread. Even. Um, so it, it's fantastic um, for actually getting to know Windows from the inside out. Um, so then there's another resource that I use it, uh, basically talking about uh, Windows access tokens, and it's this paper here, and then post-exploitation. Um, Carlos Perez runs this website, Dark Operator. He gives a number of fantastic talks at DEF CON, ShmooCon, wherever, on interesting post-exploitation stuff um, in different environments other than Linux and Windows, namely OSX and whatnot. So post-exploitation is really all about making the most out of every successful exploitation. Um, so common activities or targets for post-exploitation behavior involve stealing user credentials, uh, whether they're clear text passwords, perhaps from some job site, or uh, for uh, they're actually password hashes, which can be later cracked or then or passed along as is to other basically login mechanisms and other systems. Um, other activities involve maintaining access. Um, you want to. We'll talk about the goals there. Um, covering tracks, we've talked about a bit. Um, expand, expanding act, attacker control, which really uh, basically um, leads into pivoting and passing the hatch, and we'll talk about these things. So post-exploitation techniques really entirely depend on the architecture and platform. Um, so it requires some familiarity with the target system, um, whether it's a Windows platform, Unix, Linux pass platform, et cetera. Um, even if you don't have a great level of familiarity with these systems, you're not you know, a pro at getting around the command prompt, 
There's tons of cheat sheets out there. If you just search post-exploitation Windows cheat sheet or OSX cheat sheet or Android cheat sheet, there's tons out there that pen testers have put together because they have to touch a number of systems and they can't learn all of them and memorize all of them. So people have put together wonderful guides and basic things you need to you, you might need to do in a particular exploitation. Um, so they also uh, heavily depend on the security model of the target system. It may be Windows Homes, and they may not be part of the uh, uh, Active Directory network. Or it may be a corporate environment, and they may actually have Active Directory network. It may be a Linux system, and it uh, may have access control lists actually <laughs> enabled as the file system uh, mount option. Um, so those could be uh, hindering or perhaps uh, exploiting themselves to an attacker. So the general theory for basically the rise of exploit post-exploitation tools is that um, we've got, we, the, the industry has got better at writing secure software, or at least they think they have. Um, and in general, it has actually improved over the past decade. If you want to get directly some, to something, you most of the time can no longer just directly attack it. You have to get past basically what's been established in a number of uh, uh, components like the operating system is defense layers and basically striving towards defense and depth. Um, and so usually you have to get past one layer first before getting past the next one and so on. And so applications have also grown more complex. Um, perhaps it's, it's easier to exploit application A in order to get to B. Um, and, uh, and so basically, because things have become more of a, a incremental process of getting what you want done, um, it, post exploitation techniques really rely on exploiting existing features and systems and existing trust relationships and account privileges and perhaps account privileges and account accesses across the network. Um, I just have this cheesy little toy diagram showing the defense, the layers that may be in place in order to get to root. And if you get to the first layer, you may be able to get to the second, but not the third. But if you can pivot to another system that recognizes the credentials that you compromised, you may be able to get further in that trust chain. Um, Something like this probably doesn't really exist outside of CTFs, um, so, but it's worth talking about. So, <clears throat> talking about trust relationships and credentials and stuff like that, um, it really merits a, a review of basically passwords and stuff like that. So, in general, whenever a user entity makes a request to perform an action on an object, they must present credentials. That action may be, I want to read this file. And so the credentials may be username, password, and um, password cracking has, has never been easier. There's so many word lists and stuff out there. Um, a lot of security researchers say we're in the golden age of password cracking and say that the password's dead and we need to move on to something more secure. Um, there's, there's some valid merits to all of their arguments. Um, and then there's all the credentials like biometrics, and those can all be spoofed and hacked and certificates and tokens and session IDs, and those can be stolen as well in uh, various ways. Um, and so then, given, given the credentials, the system must basically make a decision whether to permit that action or to not deny that action um, in reference to the access controls set by the system. So there may be mandatory access controls, discretionary access controls, or there may be different models like capability-based. Um, which you'll probably talk about in an operating systems class or a security class outside of this one. And so in Linux, users are made very aware of permissions, and the average Linux user encounters some problem related to permissions very, 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 very early on. If you just type ls hyphen l, all the permissions are right there in front of your face. However, there's no real equivalent in Windows unless you right click and go through a nest of menus. You might be able to see some of the access uh, uh, permissions. So most experienced users of Linux systems understand the permission system well. So thus, it's commonly well understood by security and system administrators. Um, another thing about access is that from machine to machine, um, 
accessing accounts across machines is not set up to be streamlined unless the user has manually done this, like set up SSH keys um, and perhaps set up no passwords required. But those all require extra steps outside of the stock or default setup. And so uh, to recap, RUID equals the real user ID. It's the identity of the user when they log in. Um, and it can only be changed by root. It's also used by basically processes for uh, signaling. Um, EUID is what is effectively used to judge privilege and access decisions. Um, so in most cases, it is the same as RUID, but as we've seen, there's set UID bits that can be active in programs, and when those programs are executed, it runs uh, with the EUID of the owner of that, uh, that binary. <clears throat> so, and this leads us to how does Windows do this? So let's look at the Windows security model. Pretty straightforward, right? I would love to find one person in Microsoft who can sit down and explain correctly every single component and how they all play together in a time before I die of old age. Um, so there are three access control mechanisms that Windows uses to judge uh, uh, actions that entities or subjects want to perform on objects. The discretionary access control uh, list, uh, there's, the, there's privilege access control, and then there's mandatory integrity control. They like to deviate from the access control. However, there's some value to this because it does two things. It prevents basically non-elevated accounts from accessing elevated objects. Naturally, that makes sense. But also, it, pre it prevents uh, protected mode processes from accessing uh, unprotected uh, configuration files, files, uh, resources. Um, so basically, that's uh, if you study Bellapaja, the the, the Lipner integrity models. That's an, actually an integrity control, and there's some value actually security-wise to having that established. Um, so with the Windows security model, things are broken down to subjects and objects. And so subject, whenever you see it, is basically, it's an entity, but it's synonymous with the user. So before I talk about objects, I need to talk about security descriptors. A security descriptor is an object, it's basically a structure, a data structure, that contains the security information associated with a securable object. And the, the, the information can include, and it usually includes the top three of these things, the security identifiers, SID, for the owner and for the group. Um, the discretionary access control list. So for a file, it would basically specify on an individual basis which users are allowed to perform what permissions. Um, and then the, the security access control list is just like that, but it specifies under what of those actions do we need to log these things. We need to add these events to the log. So the SACL is just for auditing and logging. It's very important still. <clears throat> so in Windows, the definition of an object is a kernel object that an object is a kernel object and is a single runtime instance of a statically defined object type. Doesn't tell you very much. But Basically, objects are important because object protection and access logging are the essence of discretionary access control and auditing. So, this is a better explanation. So, objects are essentially a class or a structure for holding attributes and functions for something. Um, so. For instance, a process like calculator.exe, once you run it, is an instance of a process object type. So a file is an instance of a file object type. 
a process is an instance of a process object type. It's pretty straightforward if you explain it like that. Um, but people, I guess for some reason, prefer the, the redundant explanation or whatnot. So here's, here's basically the relationship between subjects and objects. When subjects make a request, basically, to perform an action, the system performs this access check. And so ACE, whenever you see it in the Windows environment, means access control entry. It's basically a, a row and perhaps a table saying this user is allowed to read, execute, but not write. Or this user is allowed to copy, but nothing else. Re you know, reading, copy. Um, so whenever access checks are made, basically iterates through the list. If it finds a match, it permits the action. If it doesn't find a match, it in general denies. I mean, that's how the decisions are made. So <clears throat> objects in general have a number of attributes uh, other than the, the security access control list and the discretionary access control list. They have usually a process ID number to identify the process in the process table. They have other things that influence when the process runs, like a scheduling priority number. Um, they also have a pointer to an access token object that is used for these uh, access, access control decisions. So objects in general are anything managed by the executive object manager, which is this thing there, it's something called object manager, and it manages all the objects and decisions. And it can include files, devices, mail slots, types, jobs, processes, threads, events, key events, so on, so on, so on, timers, volumes, desktops, window stations, network shares, services, registry keys, printers, active directory objects, and some things called access tokens. So access tokens are also objects. <clears throat> They are kernel objects that contain the security information for a login session. They identify the user, the user's groups, and the user's privileges. And access tokens in general are, not com are commonly not well understood. Um, so a login session is defined as all the activity between login and logout in a multi-user operating system. Um, it's maintained by the kernel. It's controlled by LSAS, which is the local security authority subsystem service. Um, and it, I believe, is uh, in part initialized by WinLogon, which loads the user's profile upon login. So during a login session in the Windows environment, if you're, say, jumping from your desktop environment to accessing files on a remote machine, it's all very streamlined. As long as you've set up the, if you, as long as you join the domain and enter the domain password, Windows streamlines it for you past there. Um, and for an Active Directory, as long as you've logged in and your system administrator has perhaps set it up for you, it's all streamlined as well. You can access many other resources across the network. And so users aren't reprompted for the credentials uh, when they access these remote resources. And so whenever you, you're talking about security, and features, there's always a trade-off that has to be made between actual security and friendliness or you know, convenience. And we've seen this a number of times in talking about news articles throughout the class. So Windows access tokens are responsible for describing the security context of a process thread. Um, so they're used by the kernel, that object manager, to make the access control decisions. And so when Another note is that when threads are created by a process, they inherit the parent process's primary token, which means that a process or a thread can have more than one token associated with it. Isn't that fabulous? So you can have all these tokens for each process. Um, so if a process gets perhaps compromised, the attacker gets access to more than one t access token that can be used as a credential to do a variety of things. So. <clears throat> The breakdown of an access token generally includes the following attributes, such as the security ID identifier, the group identifier, uh, 
the privileges associated with the, the access token, um, the default owner, the primary group of the user, um, and then also dictates what the access token allows to create other tokens, to open other tokens, to query information about other tokens, to set token info for other tokens if it has perhaps permission, to duplicate other tokens, to adjust the privileges of other tokens, and adjust the groups that other tokens belong to. So you can see how this, if privileges are, if there's privileges for objects that are allow them to manipulate other privileges for objects and so on and so on. You can see how this can become very confusing for the average uh, Windows user. And so these things typically uh, are not well understood. So each process gets an access token and all, this, all the threads that it spawns get an access token. Um, <clears throat> like I said that uh, Objects can have multiple tokens. However, they always have one that's set as the primary token that it associates with. And that is primarily used to dictate its privileges. However, they can use the other tokens that it is associated with that aren't the primary ones to make access control decisions as well, although it depends. Um, so primary token here is not to be confused with uh, token security levels. So there's too many types of tokens. There's primary, and then the other tokens that an object may contain are called impersonation tokens. Before I talk about those in detail, I'm going to talk about the four security levels that tokens that can be set to have. There's anonymous tokens, identification tokens are actually tied to a user ID or user name. Um, and there's impersonation tokens and delegation tokens. Now, as an impersonation type token and a impersonation security level, they were really trying to be friendly to people when they're designing all this. Let me tell you, they really bent over backwards on this stuff. So, impersonation tokens results from non-interactive logins sessions. So, if you're accessing just like a shared directory, like FTP share, an impersonation token will be generated. However, if you're doing something interactive, like logging in using Windows Auth, uh, virtual network connect, maybe using something like Citrix, Citrix to access another system and have interactive session, a delegation token will be spawned. And so I don't have time to talk about anonymous identification, um, but impersonation and delegation ones are the ones, security level tokens are the ones we're interested in now because they can be used to assume a different security context. So basically, they can be used to change the privileges for an attacker. And obviously, we can all see where that can go wrong. So even if another token is the primary token, if an impersonation token is present, it allows the thread impersonation type of security level, impersonation type here, it allows the thread or process to act under a different security context. Um, so this is actually commonly leveraged by developers uh, to allow system to be basically the privileges of the system token. That's basically root and the Linux equivalent to be invoked to take over and handle special functions like Windows off. If you're setting up an FTP service or server or a SQL database perhaps and you want to have the, the authentication handled by basically the Windows uh, domain or the Windows Active Directory, you can pass it off in this fashion. And so this is not uncommon. <clears throat> Delegation tokens, when they're created again in interactive sessions, like you connect with Citrix or Virtual Network Connect or Remote Desktop, and you're con controlling the mouse and the desktop and everything like that. <clears throat> if they're present, they allow that thread or process to impersonate the security context of the given token on actually other systems. So that token can then be reused and used on other systems if it's a delegation security level token. Um, and again, this was all designed to make things really streamlined. So when you're working with systems, systems uh, across the network, um, 
you're not prompted to enter your credentials. So these credentials, these tokens are set to either basically be delegation, it means you're allowed to do all these things across the network, or impersonation means you're allowed to uh, use these uh, privileges, use this elevated or other tokens privileges to perform perhaps a specific task. Um, however, there's no uh, there's no finer grain granularity that I know of past that. You can't say this is only valid for 192.168.56.5 and no other machine on the network. There's actually no fine fine grain uh, uh, restrictions that can be established at that level. Um, if it's valid on another system, it can be exploited on another system or used in an exploit rather. So. This is a screenshot of using Process Explorer. It's, from, it's the it's task manager uh, successor that I talked about in the system internal suite um, to actually dive into uh, Internet Explorer. And I can see basically in the security tab the, the settings, the object attributes for Internet Explorer, the object process here. We have basically a user that uh, owns this, that spawned this process. The security identifier in here is also packed in this long identifier. It's the integrity level and a number of other attributes. And it's basically there's sessions, there's login sessions also attributed to it. And then there's basically um, a number of flags that dictate uh, privileges. Um, and then actually diving into the permissions, uh, you can see basically this is selected for administrator. Administrator has privileges to do full control, read, write, and I don't have system selected, so you can't see that. Um, and then there's advanced past that. So it can get a little bit complicated. But at least it's all there in a GUI, um, or so it seems. So let's talk about abusing tokens. So if you compromise the system, all processes that are running, they have these access tokens stored in their object, in basically in that process memory. Um, so if you have access to read that process and say it has a system token and you have access to open token, you could steal that token. And then you can use it to basically impersonate system and whatever process you're currently running as and escalate privileges to system. And then you basically own the Windows box. So the first thing attackers want to do when they get access to a system is to basically enumerate the available tokens. That goes for any system. Basically, you want to uh, enumerate the, in Linux, you want to basically enumerate the user accounts and see which ones perhaps are loginable. And then you have those as potential vectors to gain more access. Whether or not you can directly gain access just by stealing a token or not, it's still a vector. So in Metasploit, there's a tool called Incognito. Um, and so this, is a module, let's wake up my victim and actually do this stuff. All right, so can everyone see the bottom left window? Raise your hand if you can. All right, so to uh, use incognito, I just type use incognito. if I spell it right. All right, and so the commands that are provided by the incognito tool are allow me to add, a, add various different types of users to impersonate a token that I have access to, uh, to list the available tokens, and something called snarf hashes, which we'll talk about in a bit. So I have access to the system, so I'm going to list the available tokens. <clears throat> So when I first go to do that, it tells me that I'm not currently running a system. So I don't have privileges to open every token in all the available processes. So let's see what I currently am. I'm going to do get UID. And it gets, tells me the current user ID. This is basically the effective token name that I am operating under as the attacker. So PS will basically print out, just like Linux, the processes currently running on the Windows system. Um, and so 
we see that there's a number of ones actually running with the token, primary token of system. Um, and there's a number of ones running with the primary token of my test user. So, um, Meterpreter offers a number of really awesome features. Um, so, there's an entire script called Get System. And Get System is designed to uh, iterate through a number of different known ways to steal the system token. Um, it could steal it directly from SAM, could steal it directly from LSAS, it could perhaps look for, uh, uh, it could look for processes that have the system token as an impersonation token, the non-primary token, perhaps to uh, be used for other uh, authentication or whatever features that want to be passed off to system or to the kernel, and that also allow for that token to be open. So if I type get system, it thinks for a minute, does some stuff, and tells me I got system. And so that's privilege escalation on Windows sometimes. So now I'm currently system. I have the keys to the kingdom. And so now let's type list tokens again. And now it's not going to complain because it can actually read all the tokens on the system. And so thus it provides me this nice menu saying that there's NT authority local service, NT authority local network service, there's my test user. And these are delegation tokens. And if they were existing on other systems, I would be able to fit it into the other systems given these tokens. And so <clears throat> these impersonation tokens allow me for uh, local uh, 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 privilege escalation. And so as you see from get UID, I currently have NT authority system, which is a local impersonation token. So I currently have system uh, privileges on this single machine. So, make sure I didn't miss anything. Talked about get system, talked about, haven't talked about impersonate token yet. So, let's go back down uh, to our original uh, token, just to demonstrate impersonate token. And now here I have to uh, escape the backslash, otherwise uh, the Windows uh, component that recognizes this won't read it right. And so it tells me I've successfully changed my token to test, and so I do get UID and tells me I'm test. So, <clears throat> there are other things that I can do with incognito. If I have sufficient permission with my current token, I can perhaps add a user to the system that I can then use to just normally log in. Um, and there's various different options here. Uh, you can add... Um, <clears throat> so that impersonate token command not related to the impersonation tokens in Windows. Correct. Uh, it should have been renamed to uh, maybe like activate token or migrate to token or uh, use token, something like that instead. Um, but it's 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 still fine. So <clears throat> remember the Linux. Uh, owner, group, other, permission set. So there's still there's still decisions that uh, are made on a group basis for a file in Windows. Um, we kind of mentioned that. Um, so if you create a global group and add all the users to it and then add your new user to it, if anything is marked with group allow, then that new user that you add can access it or uh, can act on the permissions provided to that new user because of that group setting and the decision that will be made. And so that's the first thing that is uh, provided by the add group user uh, function here. The add local group user uh, is, is very similar. Um, 
and is more of a local setting. Add group user, I think, can uh, apply across uh, a domain and across Active Directory, um, I believe. I haven't done a lot of testing um, in that. And so snarf hashes I'm going to talk about at the end um, when we're talking about pivoting and passing the hash. So so say I can't just use get system. Um, say Microsoft rolls out a patch and fixes all the ways that an interpreter out of the box steals a system token. Um, and to Microsoft's credit, their security team is, is very, very smart, and they're getting very, very good at uh, this stuff. Um, so <clears throat> a way an attacker can still uh, accomplish local privilege escalation is say there's some sort of network service or some sort of uh, service on the local machine that the attacker is compromised, has control of it, if, say, the administrator, whoever has the administrator token, um, connects to it and is leveraging Windows authentication, that token will be exposed to the process, and then the attacker can basically use that token, impersonate token would be the command in incognito, and then become administrator uh, himself, him or herself. So this would just get you administrator or some other user's uh, token um, in the absence of being able to just get the system token if it's locked down. So with delegation tokens, um, if they're present and recognized by other systems, the same sort of model would work as well. You have the, the administrator perhaps connects to your exploited process using Windows uh, authentication. You get the administrator token. You can then become administrator on remote systems. All streamlined and nice. So there are other relevant features for uh, post-exploitation. Um, Active Directory, I've talked about a bit. LSAS, uh, I believe I asked you guys how some tools or about existing tools that uh, exploit LSAS and find basically leaked information or just can entirely clear text passwords in its process memory. Um, and then there's also net logon, which would be if I were to do add user, I would just use Windows net logon feature to then access that new account on that system. All right, hopefully you get through the rest of this. We've got about 20 minutes. So let's talk more in depth about Meterpreter. Um, so Meterpreter is a payload. It's an advanced and dynamically sensible payload. Um, it's written in a mix of C and Ruby, and it uses in-memory DLL injection on the victim to do almost everything. Um, and it can be extended in, at runtime over the network. So these are basically the four stages to a meterpreter exploit, or an exploit that uses the meterpreter payload, I should rather say. So <clears throat> first, once, this, once the system is exploited, or the vulnerability is exploited, the payload would be step one. The target executes the initial stager. This is usually setting up some sort of network connection to receive the next stage, which would be basically the commode, it's the launch interpreter on the victim. Um, and so then two, once that network has been, network connection has been established, the stager then loads the files that has been sent to it from the attacker, namely the DLL prefix, prefixed with the flag called reflective. Um, this stub handles basically uh, the loading and injection of the DLL. That's the feature that's supported by Windows. Um, so then, once the DLLs are basically injected, the interpreter core initializes, and then after that establishes basically a TLS or SSL link over the socket back to the attacker, and basically operates like a RESTful API on um, sending a GET request. And then basically, 
once, metas, once the attacker's listener receives this, this get over the, uh, the, the encrypted channel, it then configures the client, which is written in Ruby. So everything up to this point is handled by C. So the server that coordinates this uh, listener and uh, sending the DLL and then establishing the, the uh, SSL connection uh, is all written in C. Once it gets the GET request, it launches a, the, the Ruby written client. And that's basically what all people are familiar with using the interpreter shell. And so lastly, once that's launched, it takes a little bit to load all the extensions uh, from interpreter. And so it will always, by default, load the standard API. Um, it will load other ones, the circumstances depends. But, at, but the important thing is past stage three, everything is done over an encrypted channel. So it's designed, Meterpreter itself as a payload is designed primarily to be stealthy. It resides entirely in memory, and there's nothing whatsoever written to the disk unless you tell it to upload a file or touch something on disk. Add a user will obviously add something to crash the disk if that doesn't crash. Um, so by itself, launching a, a payload, a exploit with an interpreter payload leaves no forensic evidence, which is very important for both an attacker and a penetration tester. The reason it's important for a penetration tester is because after you're done assessing the vulnerabilities of a target network, you have to do cleanup. If you've written stuff to disk, you have to delete it from disk and tell people what you did. If nothing's written to disk, it makes it easy. You can tell them with 100% certainty. If you have any doubts, just restart your system because it's all in memory and it's going to get flushed when it restarts. <clears throat> so another good thing is that no new processes are created. It's all entirely injected into the compromised process. However, it allows you to migrate to other processes, which is really, really, really interesting. Um, and so also, we mentioned the encrypted communication. It's very powerful, it's feature rich, and it, it, it provides its own basically scripting environment, and you can on the fly launch a scripting interpreter to access all sorts of features outside of the normal commands. Um, and so if you happen to perhaps write a script to augment an existing command, you don't have to rebuild my interpreter. You can just load, you can use it like I did, use incognito right there at runtime, and it will just load it without uh, having to, have, or without requiring you to re exploit, relaunch the exploit, or change anything manually. So, this is basically from the defender's perspective what would happen. Say I have a vulnerable service, say it's a web server like Apache, I find. Uh, zero day in it, I managed to basically incorporate it into Metasploit as just part of an exploit, and then my payload is an interpreter. So basically, I send basically my my encoded exploit, and the payload would be a reverse interpreter payload. Um, so then, once that runs, basically the Voln service connects back. Uh, and loads the DLLs. Um, perhaps those get detected by the firewall, but perhaps not. Um, they can be rebuilt to not. Um, then once that is established and the interpreter core is initialized based on the, on, the, on the victim, it establishes the secure channel, TLS or SSL, back to the attacker. And then the attacker can do everything in an encrypted manner. And so this outgoing connection, TLS or SSL, um, is not something that anyone would write a firewall rule to drop. You want to encourage people to use HTTPS and stuff like that. Uh, so as long as you run the uh, listener on the attacker's side on a, uh, a common port like port 80, that the firewall would allow an outgoing connection uh, over, then you would you would totally get past the firewall. <clears throat> so what part of this, any, any ideas, would say a really, really, really sophisticated network-based intrusion protection system be able to pick up on? Perhaps, yes. And then there's, well, it's two I should have an arrow back here, because 
it's, it sets up the connection and takes DLLs being sent from the, the attacker to it, usually. So that's basically the, the whole premise of stagers. Um, you have stage one, and then stage two, you send the rest of the files, usually to accomplish the rest of what you need to do. Sometimes there's a stage three, but it really depends. So basically, stage one and the communication generated by stage two would be the only things really that a defender could really pick up on. Past that, uh, the IDS wouldn't be able to help you. Um, and also, you'd have to be forensically gifted to figure out exactly what the attacker did because this interpreter is designed to be entirely stealthy and leave very little forensic evidence. So, let's talk about actually feet, actual standard commands, the standard API for Metasploit, uh, interpreter. Um, it's designed overall to provide a similar functionality to Linux shells. So you have ls for listing the contents of a directory instead of the Windows dir command. Cat will actually uh, print out the contents of a file, just like in Linux. Uh, CD and PWD work just like Linux. Uh, get UID is for basic, is the equivalent of who am I. Um, IP config is actually Windows style in Linux environments, and I think in OS X it's IF config, I'm not sure. And then PS is also uh, a Linux command for basically listing the processes. So features that allow you to basically uh, elevate commands, elevate privileges, and upload and download and manipulate the file system um, are upload. Obviously, you give it a file, upload it to the target system, the victim system. You can download files as well. Guest system, I already talked about. Hash dump. Um, Let's see. Let's get. Let's do. If I try to do hash dump as a unprivileged token, it will fail because it needs basically system token access to read the SAM directory. As I mentioned very, very, very early on this semester, SAM is a file. The SAM database is protected by the kernel, um, so the system token has essentially kernel access. So it's essentially the only token that is allowed to access the SAM directory. So if I do get system, or happen to have a system token, I can then do hash dump. And boom, I get all the password hashes for all the accounts. Now, isn't it interesting that there's like a default support account, there's help assistant account, and other things um, that perhaps come standard with whichever uh, company you bought your PC from. If it's Dell, they may have their own support this, you know, uh, managed somewhere overseas and maybe India or somewhere. Um, so there's these perhaps back doors in essence. Um, so uh, I should also mention for OS X, for, for Linux it's quite obvious. You just, if you have root you can read the shadow file. Um, there's no tool that really is needed there. Uh, and for uh, OS X, there's actually some really cool scripts written by Carlos Perez on this URL. Um, and th so there's some, some, there's some interesting features about systems that were designed for backwards compatibility. Um, you can see that I, I can't tell by looking at them what form these ha password hashes are stored in. If it's salted MD5 or it's just plain MD5. Or SHA one, two, or whatnot, um, <clears throat> or if it's landman or NT landman. Um, there's a number of settings depending on the system um, that allow for storage of passwords in multiple formats, primarily so that they can be backwards compatible with legacy systems. So before Active Directory, all passwords are stored in the the easy to compromise, easy to crack rather landman format. And so, as an effort to not screw ever everyone who wanted to adopt your new operating system, Windows offered some features that allow you to turn on backwards compatibility so you could store your password in this new secure format and the old unsecure format. Obviously, you're then just as secure as the old easy to crack format. Um, so, if you manage to get access to these parameters and you can turn them on. The next time the user logs in, it will take the password, check that 
against the existing hash, make sure it's the correct hash, password, log the user in, and then store the user's password in the old format for backwards compatibility. So Carlos Perez had a really good talk. I should have linked it. Um, how he wrote some scripts that takes that turns these on an OS X. And then on basically OS X, which is Apple operating system, um, it will then start storing anyone's password who logs in the next in, in Landman, which is way easier to crack, which is ridiculously hilarious. So um, let's talk about migrating. So I can, with Meterpreter, spawn any other process, uh, find the process, and migrate to it. So I'm going to do execute. Let's just do calc, the spawn calculator, and tells me it's process 1008. So if we wanted to find it somewhere in here, it's here, process 1008. That's being run as a test. And so <clears throat> you see, uh, that's interesting. It's running under test, and I currently have NT authority system. Mm, I don't fully understand why. But anyways, I can migrate to 1008. And now Meterpreter is running in the context of calculator. Awesome. And so on the victim machine, if I were to close this out, it would kill my interpreter session, I believe. But I don't have a lot of time to show off every little thing, so I gotta move on. So there's other features that allow you to interact with webcams. You can list the webcams that are available to that window system. And you can take a snapshot of them, of whatever they can see, which Obviously, bad guys could use for blackmail, extortion, and all sorts of things if they manage to catch a victim in a compromising situation. Um, there's other uh, commands for inter interacting with the user interface. Perhaps multiple users are actually logged on um, at the same time, which is entirely possible. You can enumerate the desktops for the currently logged in users and then change the context of whichever one you'd like. Um, you can also do interesting things like uh, uh, key logging. So key scan start. So it's going to start key logging on the victim. And so I'm just going to type IF config, hello world, username, password. And then let's, just for the sake of demo, key scan dump. If you try to stop it, then dump, it won't work. Um, and it tells me what the user is going to get. So perhaps I can't crack the passwords in time. Maybe I can catch them logging in next time. Or entering in the password for user access control prompt, which tends, tends to happen a lot. Maybe I can execute something that requires them to uh, interact with the user access control prompt, and maybe they just do it because they're used to perhaps a really annoying antivirus or something like that. There's all sorts of ways you can use your creativity to cause this to happen. So key scan, stop. Just stop key logging. <clears throat> and so yeah, those are, those are some cases uh, where it's, it's demonstrable that uh, it's not necessary to crack password hashes sometimes. Um, and so I've already talked about the backwards compatibility modes um, and so this leads us to, once you get a password hash, question? Uh, since your calculator is probably running the test, yes. uh, and whenever you get a keycomp directive, non-administrator test result, then can you still log in to the keycomp stuff? Apparently, because my get UID result is test. And so on this current on this version of Windows, yes, I do have access to that. However, that may not be permitted on Windows 7 fully, you know, with the latest service packs. So this is uh, basically a super vertible victim Windows XP service pack one machine that I've set up so I could demonstrate all these things that you can do for the sake of fitting into one class. 
Um, so in this instance, I was able to key log without system access or admin access. Uh, that's a good point. That's interesting. I'll, I'd like to try that. I'll look into that. Um, so once you have password hashes, uh, you may not need to crack them to gain access using them uh, to other systems. Um, there's some challenge response uh, protocols to allow you to access other systems, like an Active Directory, that will simply use those password hashes as is. Now, they'll use it over an encrypted channel using public-private keys set up by the domain or by the Active Directory network so that you can't just sniff them in clear text with Wireshark. But if you have access to the system already, you've compromised the system, you can pivot into other systems by providing those uh, those hashes that you've stolen in, in that basically challenge response protocol. You know the answer to the response, um, and so you just need to provide that there, depending on basically the protocol. I'm sure Windows 8 has fixed some of these uh, problems. But without even cracking a password, this will allow you, if it's possible, to just simply pivot into another system. Um, and then if you happen to have, uh, so uh, PS exec is a uh, Metasploit uh, mod, uh, auxiliary module that uh, allows you to do this easily. So other ways to pivot. In Linux, you could use existing setup SSH keys, which are just stored in the user's home directory in .ssh or .ssh underscore keys. Um, in Windows, also, there's the ntds.dit file. And as we discussed in Active Directory, if you can control that, you can control the kingdom. Um, and so then there's all sorts of ways users reuse passwords. So you could use that to perhaps log in to the user's email and send spear phishing emails as that user legitimately to perhaps infect more, sy more systems <coughs> on the network um, through social engineering. Or you could uh, try net logon or SSH which, with those existing passwords or log into a content management system, perhaps an intranet web application or internet web application, perhaps log into their Facebook, who knows. Um, so when attackers want to maintain access, the main goals they want to accomplish is to, first and foremost, avoid discovery. Um, and if they do to get discovered, they want to survive the steps taken after discovery. Uh, so they want to survive patching, which is difficult, and they want to survive rebooting or blue screen of death or any crashes that may occur. So that's where perhaps adding a user may come in handy. Uh, however, you have to make sure it's hidden like those manufacturer help desk back doors and stuff like that. Um, and so there's other ways that we've talked about. You could have things set to automatically run on startup. Or if you wanted to go the full nine yards, you could utilize a rootkit. However, um, if we want to talk realistically about rootkits, if an attacker or a pen tester were to design a rootkit, they would probably never disclose it uh, unless for a large amount of money um, because it requires a lot of work, a lot of expertise. Um, so Linux, you can add users with root shell access. That's really straightforward. However, that's going to show up in the password file. There's not many ways to hide that. Which brings us to some more advanced topics. Um, uh, this is out of place. Um, such as uh, injecting backdoors into the system. Um, if you're going to have things that automatically run, it is not unprecedented to take existing systems that are already running and inject bugs into them that are actually backdoors. Anyone who's done an uh, extensive amount of code auditing and bug hunting is extremely familiar with clever, uh, ex extremely capable of cleverly disguising bugs in it uh, as backdoors, or covering disguising backdoors as bugs. So introducing interesting bugs to a system that only you know how to exploit, or someone who's equally capable could discover, um, and that would allow you access to the system. So Stuxnet did this. Um, there was something in the keyboard layout uh, configuration file they did that caused the keyboard layout manager to actually have a, uh, a vulnerability that they could then remotely access, which was interesting. Um, 
So uh, that's about it for class. These are really just the basics. Um, your ability to do post-exploitation is really only limited by your creativity and familiar, familiarity with the system. Um, so next time, we're going to, this has all been pen testing for the most part. We're going to turn the tables, do instant response level work, and I'm going to take basically this, I'm going to take the victim, we're going to run volatility on it, and we're going to look in memory basically at all the forensic details that are going on with exploitation techniques like this. So you have some basic idea of what you would look for if you're put in a, in a position of an incident response and investigating what an attacker has actually done to the system. Any questions on the homework? Has everyone started it? Uh, so hint about problem one on the homework, which is that uh, login prompt. The username and password is admin password. I'm not asking for that. I'm asking for basically a SQL injection for that form that will allow you to bypass it without entering an admin password. Um, so I mentioned uh, things like, I mentioned that meta characters may be helpful. So when I talk about meta characters, uh, <clears throat> each component usually in the web application has its own set of meta characters. So there's two components. There's PHP and then there's MySQL. So It'd be useful to know the meta characters for each component and then think about how you could use it. You've already been given the source code for that login prompt. How you can use it to craft the rest of the SQL statement. You know what the PHP code is doing to each, imp each input for the, uh, the form. For the username is doing this or nothing, for the password is doing whatever. Um, and you can see exactly what you need to do to be able to craft a SQL statement that might uh, bypass the authentication. It's not it's not very difficult, and that pretty much just gave you the answer. So.